Live from JMT Studios, it's time for Two Jersey Kids, the best video game podcast on the planet. What is up all you Jersey Kids? This is episode 55 of the Two Jersey Kids podcast, the Bay Gaming podcast that comes to you every Friday. I am the host, Adam Buckingham. Alongside me is my best friend, the best to can learn the business, Gary Seisel. How are you doing today, Gary? Good, good, sir. It's good to be back again in the studio. That is the JMT studios that I, of course, <laughs> talk about. Ne- Wait, no, that's not me. That's someone else um, that they talk about in the intro, of course. But uh, yeah, it's exciting to be back for another episode. 55. I'm, uh, I'm excited. Yeah. What's up? Uh, before we roll into everything, I just want to just give a, you know, let everybody know where they can find us on the Twitter sphere. You can find the podcast at Two Jersey Kids. We have a Facebook page. Uh, you can go to our website, Two Jersey Kids, and then uh, it's just on our Twitter page. But yeah, if you're a new listener, please stick with us to the end. Maybe hit that subscribe button. Maybe you'll like us. We are Two Jersey Kids. We release every Friday, give you a breakdown of what's going on in the gaming industry news-wise, and give our genius, very biased opinions when it comes to all the video game news. They're good. Co- they're or maybe a, a Nintendo hating this episode, or Nintendo loving, depending on who's talking. Me specifically, because I love, I, I'm a fan of Nintendo. But Gary, he always hates on Nintendo. If you <laughs> listen to us long enough, uh, I don't know where I got that that final accent. It was like a older, uh, it was like an old announcer uh, voice. I don't know what what was yeah, going was, on there. It was Wasn't appropriate. Those long enough, uh, but before we roll into everything, Gary. What have you been up to? I just want to chat with you. We haven't really talked to... Well, we've been talking, obviously, because we're friends. But we haven't talked over the Skype. What have you been up to, my man? <laughs> well, uh, so I've been streaming, uh, as I have been talking about, I guess, for the past few weeks. been playing a lot. For the past, like, two months now. Yeah, it's actually been a long... It's been longer than I thought, actually. Yeah, it has been a while. But um, I've been playing a lot of player or PUBG. It's been it's been fun. I've been getting a lot better. It's been actually interesting to see the progress of me and my friends playing together. We become a little more cohesive and also a little more, you know, effective fighting other people. So it's uh, definitely been a lot of fun streaming that game. However, I'm still dying for the release of Destiny Two. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm just so excited. I know Adam, I was waiting for you to roll your eyes. I thought you were gonna be kind of kind of annoyed with me, but <laughs> anyway, I'm looking forward to Destiny Two playing that game. It's just, uh, it's going to be a great, what's up? You have eight followers, Gary. I'm proud of you. <laughs> yeah, I kind of do need more followers. So if anybody's listening to this podcast right now, please feel free to find me on Twitch TV. It's, uh, I think it's scavenger. It's S C A V three name. Damn it. It's because someone else had scavenger. I already talked about this in previous episodes. So it's S C A V three N G E R 18. It's fucking okay. stupid, man. Change your name to Gary Sisel or Sisel or Sizzle or fuck I could. anything that's better I than could. just scavenger with the number in it. Come on, man. I hate my name, but there's I, I just have a hard time figuring out something else that works. I'll have to think about something, but I don't know. I'll have to, I feel like I would have to change my Twitter handle, too. I don't know. Who knows? But, oh, no. He's God forbid uh, your thousands upon thousands of Twitter followers are going to be confused and yeah. you change your Twitter handle. <laughs> oh, no. Where am I going to hey. find Gary Seisel, the best stick handler know, in the man. business? That's what you should you That's never know. what your Twitter handle should be, honestly. Oh, yeah. um, but you mentioned before we started actually recording that you're planning on, you're excited you're going to purchase NHL 18. Is that the, the new one coming out? True, true. What, what yeah, makes you more I, uh, excited about purchasing NHL 18 than the past NHLs? It, it seems like it, this is just going to be a fresh coat of paint. You're probably more in the know in these hockey sphere you know, versus, I don't know what I'm saying, video games. There it is. That's the word. It's um, it's like, for me, with NHL games now, I don't really care too much anymore about the franchise modes and everything. I, it's just not something I feel like sinking my time into anymore. To be honest, so publishers out of, there, when you when you print the the cover of NHL 18, make sure you quote Gary Sisel on that. I don't care too much. I just anymore. I really don't. It, it's because it doesn't it doesn't in like really. I, I don't feel like I'm immersed as immersed into it as I used to be when I was a kid. Where I guess maybe I had a better imagination and I kind of just like that was part of the fun. Uh, now I just it's not something that really interests me too much. So I'll, I I think the thing that I'm most looking forward to with NHL. 18 is the EASHL, basically like the online leagues where you can play with friends and stuff like that. So this year they have a three-on-three mm. game type, which is more arcade-ish. Could be a lot of fun. 
it's something I kind of I've been wanting for years because not only is it more arcadish and more fast pace and allow for more creativity, it also gets rid of a lot of the AI players in the ice that are just flat out <laughs> stupid. So that's just awesome as well. So, so I'm they, really I. So with this arcade mode, is it just going to be more like NHL hits? Is that basically where it's more dumbed down version, or what exactly have you seen when it comes to this mode? You know, it's actually funny you mentioned that. I actually don't know if it's going to be how exactly arcadey it's going to be. I don't know if it's going to be the NHL 18, just a straight up 3v3, or if it's going to be, be more if it's just straight up 3v3. I feel like if you're going to advertise mind it. that, uh, it should be more arcadey. I think. I would think. Actually, actually, now that I think about it, I think it's going to be a smaller rink you're playing on too. So I think there is definitely like a NHL hits type vibe to it. Mm. I don't know if you're going to be putting three people into the stands though, necessarily. <laughs> maybe <laughs> like they, with maybe a body they, check. Maybe they crank up the sliders on everything just to a thousand. Yeah. So you're just firing yeah. shots on left and right. I mean, it'll, it'll awesome. go back to uh, your days in, on the 360 era playing NHL three on three or whatever it was called, and you wanted to show off your skills when it comes to that. I used to, dude, I'll tell you what, I mean, I was younger then, so I felt like I used to care way more about, like, stats and stuff, so, dude, I remember, dude, I went so hard in that game, like, I was just, I was good at that game, and I was Mm -hmm. just, like, destroying people, but I was like, all right, I got, like, I got, like, four losses now, I can't get to five, you know, like, it's so ridiculous, but, yeah, those days, man, they were fun. Fun time. I remember playing on the 360 with you. We would alternate back and forth because we were pretty solid at it. But I mean, you touched on a good point when it comes to back it comes to playing older when we were younger playing sports games where you kind of had more invested in it. I mean, back then yeah. it wasn't nearly as realistic as it is nowadays, but it felt more realistic because you sort of invested in each scenario, got hyped for every game that you're playing, whether it's a playoff series or you're trying to build up your team from the bottom, and then now you're there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did that. Um, but <laughs> like, for example, when we played the NHL, you know, I always go back to this as a classic example. When we were playing an NHL franchise with the Flyers, you know, going down three one or playing against the Ottawa Senators, and it was a grind every single, you know, game. It just felt like each game was its own quote unquote story. So it always, as a kid, you always attribute more, you know, feelings to each game you're playing or each scenario that's going on in the game. Where now, get older. I don't know if it's just getting older or you just don't put enough as much emphasis into a sports game or a for- sports franchise or cuz I know playing some games I still put effort and I still have that yeah. excitement when it comes so to speak and I'm sure you feel that way when it came to Destiny or uh Destiny 2 when you're playing any competitive mode in that that area but I'm not sure maybe that was back in the day where cranking up the difficulty on in a sports game sort of brought that competitive vibe out of uh, so well, to speak. it's, it's kind of like it's not that I don't care about the franchise mode as much now. It's just the idea that I feel like it's just so in depth now. You know, like, like, I don't really care yeah. about ticket sales necessarily. I, I like I like controlling every aspect of my team, like being able to control players, contracts. That's great, but I don't care about concession stand sales. And that, and that's one thing I had against two K NBA two K was that that was kind of part of it. And I was like, I don't give a shit about this stuff. This is irrelevant to what I'm trying to do. Um, but I, I mean, I still very much get into sports games, like into the individual games, especially playoff mm-hmm. games. You know, if it's a championship game or something, I mean, those can be intense if if the game's actually challenging enough. You know, against computer players, but you know, sometimes it just isn't, and that's what kind of takes the fun out of it for me. Mm. So I wonder, I wonder how much actually people invest in those, you know, those nitty gritty details when it comes to the sports games. Is it a lot or is it a little bit? I mean, I know a lot of the time when you go MLB the show is the to the umpteenth degree when it comes to the amount of nitty gritty details you have to deal with with all the teams that you have to deal with and most of the time I would always put on auto but you would still pop up where you have to make a quick snappy decision all the time if you're trying to simulate through when you just kind of want it to go automatically all the way through so it's kind of funny that now you wanted realism back in the day when it came to these certain modes but now I think it's gone a little too far where we don't care too too much about those like ticket sales or i know you like designing the the stadium and all that like the grand the big things but not the individual like minutia of running a hockey organization because that's never going to be simulated properly in a game i don't think i don't think anybody's gonna really really excited about that because you're not actually raking in real money because let's be real money makes the world go around exactly all i need all i need out out of a sports game is obviously good gameplay the ability to design the jerseys, 
ability to design the stadium. I remember and that's playing, awesome. I remember playing club. It, uh, that's what you got most excited about when we were, the first time yeah. we played a, the NHL club online feature, whatever it was called back then, and you just loved designing the jerseys. I still get excited, dude. When we played club <laughs> this past game, dude, NHL 17, when we played club, I would have like a new jersey every month. It was like every month Damn. a new jersey would be released. It was sick, dude. Were you sponsored sick. by anybody? Any fake industry? No, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, you should be. You should be one of the designers for sports. I'm sure uh, you can just design any crazy thing. I mean, look at Under Armour, uh, University oh, of Maryland. Yeah. Their jerseys are nuts. Every year, it's like well, dude, something different, and they go bonkers. Well, it's like Oregon too. Oregon has a new jersey every minute. I mean, yeah. seriously, Nike. Or I, think, I think it's Nike, yeah, right? Nike, Nike's Oregon, and Under Armour's Maryland. So yeah, hopefully, maybe our football team will get. To the level of Oregon one day, because you all have all that Under Armour money rolling in. Even though it seems like their cleats always f up our players, because they're always going down with leg or knee injuries. So that's a great, you know, <laughs> endorsement of Under Armour. Yeah. If you want to sponsor Under Armour, if Kevin Plank, if you're listening to me, if you want to sponsor Two Jersey Kids, feel free. You're more than welcome to. Um, but uh, I guess we roll right now into because what i'm going to talk about what i've been up to is going to actually be in the news but uh let's go into this week in gaming brought to you by gatorade but not really it's moby games but if you sponsor us on under armor i'll put you in there instead of gatorade wink wink nudge nudge kevin hit me up for fellow terps gary what's up the first game we have on the list is nhl 2k10 released on ps3 xbox 360 and ps2 so, of course, this kind of fits into the NHL theme we have going on Yeah, so if you guys didn't podcast. get enough of NHL discussion between me and Gary, here's some more. Exactly. It's not really too much of an in-depth thing. You guys know what an NHL game is. It's a hockey game. So, the interesting thing about this particular entry into the 2K franchise is that this was the last 2K hockey game to re- be released on console, as NHL 2K11 was released on the iPhone and the Wii. Now... The unfortunate thing really here is that 2K stopped making hockey games. They declined their games. Like It was really weird. They had this this span of time where they were making these amazing hockey games from like, I guess, maybe 2K3, 2K4 to like 2K7. And then 2K8 hit and suddenly everything went to hell. Control sucked. The game just felt weird. The game looked weird. I mean, the graphics were never the best in 2K games anyway, but the was gameplay the, always kind of. Was that the game where you could play as the goalie? I can't remember um, when I would specifically play people online in NH in the NHL 2K game that I had. Specifically, nay. people would always switch to the goalie and do that bullshit slide mechanic where you could have your goalie just automatically slide and it would block a good three fourths to actually good ninety percent of the net just because well, he's on his side. You could do it in the EA versions too, I believe. So it could have been either or. I, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. It was definitely a 2K either game. <laughs> But um, but yeah, this was the last game of the series to be released on console. Uh, they, after this, EA basically has they have complete monopoly now over all hockey games, which is kind of a disaster in a way, in my opinion. I don't like the fact that they just can churn out sort of different games every year. Although I will say they have been making the effort recently, it seems, to actually put more features into the game, interesting features. So anyway, yeah, this is the last game on console. I, 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 I'm just curious why... Uh, 2K has not gone into another, uh, I guess, sports market. Well, I guess they they're only they kind of failed. They, they can't go into a- NHL still, or not NHL, NFL, because Madden I think still owns the rights. If I'm correct, yeah. I could be wrong. Um, NHL, I'm not sure if that's a big enough market they see nowadays to you know it isn't be viable at all because now Madden or not Madden, <laughs> I keep fucking it up. EA now controls NHL franchise because that's what everybody knows. And baseball, their last baseball game was garbage. And again, uh, are they going to really try to hop back into that market? Who knows? Because, uh, I mean, they make fantastic NBA games. Uh, and yes. I think that's what they're going to continue with. Uh, they sell bonkers, buku amount of uh, titles. And NBA, I think, is still on the rise now. as becoming one of the prominent leagues that people care about more and more nowadays. Um Honestly, there's a plethora of reasons why, maybe just because less you have more star power uh, in NBA because they don't wear helmets. You can actually see their faces. Um, 
not the main stars get injured as much like in fucking NFL. They drop every single week over non-contact or contact injuries and all the cacophony of stuff that goes on. I don't I like the th- I feel like I'm sometimes try to be like Stephen A Smith on like ESPN where I just throw in bullshit words but I don't even know if it works properly. I just throw it in yeah. there. It sounds I've right. Noticed. <laughs> I've noticed. It, it, it sounds right. I'm just going to put it in there. No one will know unless I point it out like I'm doing right now. But, uh, Gary, do you want to finish this or do you want to move on to the next game? I Yeah, I'll move on to the next game. I mean, basically, the whole thing here with Angel 2K was just the fact that the series just com- completely, the wheels just came <laughs> off. And now, and now here we are where EA has basically the sole rights to NHL, the NFL, and well, not the MLB because uh, the show has that now. But they really, really fell off. Two K, two K games just fell off after like two thousand and eight or whatever. So anyway, moving on to the next game, which is Halo Reach, released on Xbox three hundred and sixty in twenty ten. Now, for those, of course, that are unfamiliar with this game, kind of like me, really, I, I played the Halo series growing up. I played Halo one, two, and three. Then I never played any of the other games. So anyway, if you're unfamiliar, the game takes place in the year. 2552, where humanity is locked in a war with the alien covenant. Players control Noble Six, a member of an elite super soldier squad, when the human world known as Reach falls under covenant attack. After releasing Halo 3 in 2007, Bungie split into into teams to develop two different games, what would become Halo 3, ODST, and Reach. The developers decided to create a prequel to the original Halo game trilogy, freeing themselves from the obligation of addressing old story threads, as the game would take place on a... (laughs) As the game would take place on a human world doomed to be destroyed, they focused on making the environment a character unto itself. Now, longtime Halo composers Martin O'Donnell and Michael Salvatore returned to compose Reach's music, music, aiming for a more somber sound to match the story. Now, I just kind of wanted to add that in there, sort of like a uh, sort of like a trivia, a background on the game. Now, overall, this game would do extremely well. The game grossed you uh, uh, well. The game grossed a U.S. $200 or $200 million profit on its first day, launch day, setting a new record for the franchise. I, I really couldn't figure out what I was saying there. But <laughs> it overall... happens to me all the time. Just do the Michael Scott method where you just keep talking until you finally find your, your point that you're getting at. Yeah. Got to get that rhythm going. But yeah, in terms of reviews, it reviewed very well. On Metacritic, Metacritic it received a uh, 91 out of 100. Basically, everywhere I look, it's like 9 out of 10, 9.2 out of 10, 90%. Now, let me tell you so something, Gary. Well. Let, me, let me tell you now, something, Gary. Adam has, Adam has his own take on this game. So here you go. Now, to, to fit in the role of, you know, I was Stephen A. Smith prior with all the bullshit words that I was throwing in there trying to make myself sound smart. Now I'm going to be the Skip Bayless and take do the hot take. <laughs> Halo Reach was a steaming pile of garbage. Nah, okay, it's not that bad. It was okay. Um... I thought story wise didn't really excite me all too much. I remember the mind blowing thing is when you get to the end, you you know you save the ship where they're rolling in Master Chief, and that's where you know Halo One takes off. But the main thing that sticks in my crawl, that grinds my gears, I can't think of any other you know combination of words that suits that. So I'm just gonna stop right there. But the online, online, the main thing that I cared about back in the day where I when I was playing on the 360 and playing these Halo games was the online features and the online feel of this game. And I felt like this game in particular tried to go too much down the rabbit hole of like being somewhat like Call of Duty, I guess you could say, where it felt like you were sort of tied into certain features. And it just didn't feel like Halo. didn't feel as arcadey as some Halo games did. And it just felt wrong. It just... I can't remember... Because I haven't played Reach in forever, and I'm glad that uh, the new Halos didn't go down that rabbit hole, what they were trying to do. Uh, But I just can't remember what specifically annoyed me a lot about it. I just know that I did not like the multiplayer. It just didn't feel right. didn't feel like the proper Halo game. It felt like it was trying to be something that it completely wasn't at all, uh, where it had... It felt like you had certain types of loadouts, which made no sense. I could be wrong on that matter, but that's what sticks in my brain. So, uh, yeah, I just have a bad image when it comes to Halo Reach, and I never want to stick that game in my 360 ever again. Take that if you want as a euphemism. (laughs) All right. See, that's the thing about these games. You know, it's like after you get past, you have like a a franchise or like a, a... I don't know, a console maker, if you want, if that's the proper term, like the Master Chief. Like he was like the character that made the, the Xbox. 
even made the Xbox 360 really in, in a way. And suddenly he's not in the story anymore. You know, you have a different story going on with a different character, different setting. And it's like, how do you, is the game going to feel the same to fans? And obviously in your case, it didn't. So it's like a, a risk you take, I guess. I mean, I, apparently a lot of people enjoyed it. So uh, you may be in the minority, I guess, in terms well, of people the that insiders. don't. insiders. They don't know yeah. anything. Yeah, clearly. Clearly they don't know what they're talking about. They're or 90% garbage. of the people, maybe. Just yeah. kidding. They're not all garbage. Just some are just trying to be like hot takes or hop on uh, companies D just for shits and gigs because I don't know why. But it just it – just, because, of course, when it comes to video games, everybody has a differing opinion. When it comes to you, Gary, you hate Nintendo just because you just, you're just you a Nintendo no. hater and they wronged you in no. the past. It's just it, – no. it's the way things is. We're all they humans. Just... We have some biases and it just happens. And when, it comes to Halo Reach, and when it comes to Halo Reach, I just don't like it. Uh, but should we get into the, the news, Gary? Yeah, and before you, uh, before we get into the news, yeah, Nintendo makes bizarre decisions. That's why I'm very uh, critical of what, of what they're about here. But yeah, move on to the news. Take it away. Starting off, apparently Fortnite, you know the game that uh, was released by Epic Games recently uh it was talked about way back when some e3 ago where it had like a pve sort of uh tower defense mixed with crafting mechanics kind of like orcs must die but with guns or basically like that um but they released a few months back but apparently they're introducing a battle mode that's coming to ps4 uh on september 26th they wrote in a, a ps playstation blog post quote we are excited to announce a new mode coming to Fortnite on September 26th, Battle Royale. 100 players, one giant map, a battle bus, Fortnite building skills combined with intense PvP combat. The last player standing wins. Our Battle Royale mode is now in public test for Fortnite players, and we would love your help testing it. Just open the game and select Battle Royale. We expect the mode to experience crashing and stability issues during the public test. Yeah, we we made a PvP mode for Fortnite. We love Battle Royale games like PUBG and thought Fortnite would make a great foundation for our own version. A few months ago, Epic's Unreal Tournament began, uh, a team began experimenting with the mode while the original Fortnite team kept updating the core game. To maintain the balance We kept the PvP mode completely separate from the PvE mode. The new Battle Royale mode was so much fun, we decided to share it with everyone. uh, Everyone to get feedback. Now, I specifically, because I've been clamoring for a Battle Royale uh, game on the console that I have, since I don't have a powerful PC to run anything right now, uh, I went out right away when I saw this and purchased Fortnite because it was also on sale for like 25%, which they add in the blog post, of course, because, you know, marketing. Capitalism, folks! Purchase games! Don't pirate! Yay! <laughs> um, but I went out, specifically purchased it. I actually have been kind of enjoying it because I can understand the the vibe that people get uh, when they play PUBG. It's very intense. Uh, right now, there's no squad mode to it, uh, and if you do play as a squad, I think you can get banned right now. But there will be, but this is for public test purposes only. I'm not sure if they're going to be a leveling up system. I know when I went into the PvE area, just to check it out, there is a level up mechanic where you're leveling up your quote-unquote base, uh, getting better things for your base. Um, but I haven't dove much into that because I care too much about playing just the battleground mode just because I've been into it. And I, I kind of... From what I've seen from PUBG, it kind of adds an interesting mechanic because this is definitely feels more "quote unquote" arcadey, especially with the environment that it looks. It looks more arcadey. The, the art style that it's using, obviously, you're floating around in a party bus with, that has a hot air balloon attached to it, where it flies over the map. You know the generic things. You glide down. You uh, there's chests all around. You can collect weapons. It's the generic things you you would get in a battleground game but what i do like which i kind of adds an interesting twist is the crafting mechanic to a battleground game where specifically an example where it actually can benefit you i remember when i first started and i didn't really know too much about the crafting i was just messing around in the pve and then i was trying to mess around in the battleground there's a sniper somebody with a a long range uh, weapon that was shooting at me from a hill so i was trying to get away so i specifically just switched to crafting mode and i had enough materials because you still have to collect materials with your mining axe but i had enough material materials to start building walls so i was running i was in i had wall mode up so i would run hit 
you know, hit R2 to make the wall start appearing, so it has less health, but it's still building up, so it blocks the person from shooting at you. And I, was keep, <laughs> I would keep running back with building walls so they would, um, you know, so they couldn't hit me, and I was able to escape. I died a little bit later, but uh, I got I got kind of cool, I, though. I got a chat with Gary to get more tips. I think the best tip or the best thing that I learned is not to jump out of the plane right away. Because when I when we go across the map, I just look out the back of the bus and just fucking everybody. It just like yeah. it looks like the bus is having like a you know ha- having a trip to the bathroom. Had uh, some stomach issues with diarrhea going on. Just oh, everybody <laughs> just shooting out the back left and right. I like Christ. to wait to the end. What? Am I being too graphic? <laughs> <laughs> well, not really. I mean, I don't give a damn. But our viewers might. Uh, but, um... Maybe. I'm sorry. But um, another cool thing that happened with the crafting mechanic, too, is that you can hunker down if you're in a, if you're in the bubble, uh, which everyone playing Battleground games is a bubble that you go to. It shrinks. You know, it's basically PUBG just in the same world. But if you find a house or a building or an area that you like, you can sort of craft it up so you can build it um, – so it only has like one entrance way. You can block some doors along the way. Uh, if you can find in the map, you, there's traps in the map that you can collect and then place down on the the ground so people could accidentally you could funnel people in that way. Uh, I saw, and then uh, another example of using the crafting mechanic to your advantage. Uh, I was getting shot when I was crossing a bridge, and somebody was coming across the bridge. Uh, so I was going under. Somebody was shooting me from the far, uh, like on the grass area. Uh, I ran, uh, I went in to heal up, and I could tell that they were going to start running across the bridge. So I decided to place some brick walls at the end of the bridge uh, so they couldn't get by. And then I would place it on the outside so they only had to come one way. They couldn't flank me uh, any specific way, so I had, they had to come that way. And I ended up taking them out because, you know, nice. that's me. Uh, I realized that the rifle, the, the gunplay is still not... I mean, it's more arcadey. It doesn't feel. I don't think it would feel as good as PUBG, but I think it gets the job done. Well, I just know that the best thing for me right now with aiming is up close with a shotgun because that's the best chance I have of killing anybody. <laughs> See, I. It's funny you say about the uh, the whole aiming thing. You know, the gunplay because the gunplay in, in PUBG doesn't always feel crisp at all. Kind of, it feels off at sometimes. I mean, I had a discussion with Ben last night. Uh, my friend Ben last night when we were when I was streaming ben about gets how so many shout outs on this shit show. Jesus, that was a tongue twister. Oh, yeah. Ben gets so the, many shout outs on this show. There we go. He's part of the he's part of the crew, you know, part of the gaming crew. But anyway, he's part of the Jersey um, Kids crew. Yeah. But yeah, there's just times where, you know, in PUBG where it just doesn't feel crisp or like things happen. You're like, what the hell just happened to me? Was, you know, was it internet connection? Was it me? Uh, you know, it's just very strange, but that's it's beside the you. point. Um, no, it's you. The thing about this. I'm actually really excited to see what, how this game does. Like I, I have, I don't mind arcadey shooters. I mean, I really haven't played many in my time, but it's it's something that definitely piques my interest. Um, the only thing, though, I wonder how long it's going to take before this battleground mode is going to kind of get played out. I said this before. I think I said this last episode mm-hmm. where we were talking about, oh, it's only a matter of time before these big name companies start jumping on and start making all these yep. games. It's only a matter of time, I think, before this battleground mode. It's like it becomes the the World War II Call of Duty from <laughs> 10 years ago where everybody's like, all right, it's another World War II game. Can we move on to something different? It's going to be the same thing, I feel like, with this. And I think it's going to take just, a little while because it does – it takes – because, I mean, you saw that Call of Duty or the World War II games lasted for a good period and then finally put oh, yes. out the hint. Uh, I feel like no, Battleground, Battleground modes will continue to last for a few years if not yeah. more, it's just it's just wondering when it's going to finally run its course. And I wanted to ask you: Does PUBG have like a progression system outside of the game where you actually get any experience or anything? Well, it, it does, but it's nothing. It's like you get coins, I guess, for every game you play, every game you win, every kill you get. But all you really do is buy cosmetic stuff or aesthetics. Yeah. So, seeing as it's kind of like an early access game. A lot of the stuff you have, like a lot of stuff you can buy, it really isn't anything special. They didn't really have a lot yet. And on top of that, with the way the game is, some stuff that you put on is going to give away your position more. Like if you put on a striped red T-shirt, <laughs> which is possible, you're going to look like an asshole. You know, it's like it's like it's like everybody. It's like that Family Guy episode where they're what? It's Peter and I think in Vietnam, and he's walking through the uh, the forest with like two soldiers, and he's like, "You guys are morons. They're going to be looking for army guys." He's wearing a fucking clown suit in the middle of the forest. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, 
so it's like, <laughs> yeah, some of this aesthetic, aesthetic stuff is not going to work <laughs> for this game. Oh, so, yeah. man, Family Guy. I haven't watched that in a while, but there's some quality shows in that. I mean, it fell off at the end, but there's some quality comedy in that show. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really like the recent seasons. I like more of the mid, like the middle seasons from like, I don't know, the beginning to like 2007 ish. Fucking John Basile can quote basically anything sure. from that show. You remember that? He would always quote it left and right when it, just for shits and gigs, and he would try to do the voices as well. Some were good, some were bad. The pedophile old man, he was very good at. Of course, Say of course he that. was good at that one. <laughs> yeah. Say what you will about that. Who knows? Um, just kidding. He's not like that. He's the he's a great man. He's a great guy. He's a good Jersey kid. Um. But I'm interested to see if they do have some sort of progression progression system like they have for the PVE portion of it. Uh, they should. Uh, when I have it to does say, finally get released, because right now it's in public test, so I'm not sure if they just didn't add that feature. Maybe they'll add it on the 26th. But I look forward to hopping more into it uh, this weekend sometime, I think, when uh, you know, I have the apartment to myself for a little while. Cool, cool. I, I actually have to say, as a final note on this uh, subject, I really do like hope they add something like that into PUBG. I, I don't know how they would do it, but I guess it could work for like, Fortnite's a different game. But like progression systems, I feel like almost for me anyway have to be in games. It keeps me going. It keeps mm-hmm. me engrossed in the game. Like I like PUBG as it is right now, where it's kind of like you know you just go into a game, you play, you're done, and you go to the next game. But you know there, there is definitely something missing, I think, from the game for me, and that might be kind of it. But you know that's that's whatever. I don't know, maybe it could add some sort of, I don't know what would be, progression-wise, what would what would you be able to add that's not actually, you know, uh, a detriment to other players that you're getting a better, you know, you're getting one up in a certain skill well, or something, damage or something that sort of gives you an unfair advantage, so to speak. It really- there really isn't anything, I don't think. I mean, it would really all have to be cosmetic because you, the game's all about RNG. I mean, you know, I like last. I, I'm not going to get too far into this, but like last night, I, I landed on the ground, landed down, and I go to run into a building. A guy lands right in front of me. He runs into the doorway, and right there on the floor, as if it was a welcome mat, he finds an M16 and kills me with it. Who the fuck finds an M16 ever in that game? Like right off the drop, it was like at his feet. So yeah, RNG. That's what. That's the thing. You can't really have progression system like that. In PUBG, because it it's all RNG. M16 difficult to find in PUBG, because I have no idea. I don't, not, I don't know how outraged I should be right now. It's not difficult to find you know, throughout the game, but like right in the beginning when you land, and you're trying to run, look for a gun somewhere, and some guy finds an F16 and blows you away, and you have not found a gun, yes, that is very, very annoying. But that's beside the point. Take, just keep going. But I did want to make mention that I feel like this is definitely a, a smart addition to this game because a lot of people weren't talking about it, so to speak. I know people had some good things to say about it, but didn't have too, too much. And I feel like this could add some longevity to the game later down the road, especially for PS4 owners that aren't going to have PUBG coming out for their console. They want a Battle Royale game, and, you know, here you go. Um, so we'll see if people keep up with it. I... I found matches actually really quickly in that game, shockingly, for just a public test. I would hop in, it would take me eight seconds, and I'd be in, you know, running around trying to find, uh, or waiting, you know, do the generic thing that you see in PUBG where you go to a specific area, everyone's running around, you can't hurt each other, and you're running around with pickaxes and all that jazz. But moving on, apparently Nintendo is bringing back the NES Classic Edition in 2018. In a Nintendo announcement, they made sure to clarify that. And also that they're bringing more SNES classics. But, quote, due to the incredible demand for the upcoming Super Nintendo Entertainment System, the Super NES Classic Edition system, Nintendo plans to ship the retro-inspired product in 2018. Originally, the shipments were announced to cease at the end of the calendar year. In addition, more units to the Super NES Classic Edition will ship on its September 29th launch day in the U.S. than were shipped of the NES Classic Edition all last year, with subsequent shipments arriving in stores regularly. Fans have shown their unbridled enthusiasm for this classic edition system for these classic edition systems, so Nintendo is working to put many more of them on store shelves. Ellipsis. Next summer, some uh, next summer Nintendo will also bring 
bring back the Nintendo Entertainment System, the NES Classic Edition system, with new shipments. More information about the timing and the return of the NES Classic Editions will be announced in the future. Gary, does that get you excited? Because I know you mentioned them before. You're excited for the NES Classic Editions. Of course, uh, sort of Nintendo, you know, stood you up on that. Uh, burned that bridge because they didn't have enough for you. Were you, uh, yeah. salt- are you still salty about it? I mean, not really. It's not. It's not like something I. I absolutely had to have. It was something I was interested in. But you know, the fact that they just didn't bring enough, you know, units to the table essentially for people to buy. That's kind of annoying. And now that they're bringing it back, it just kind of screams that. Oh yeah, you know, we're making good on our promise to get all these consoles to people. Uh, <coughs> we actually want the money. Um, I mean, know, isn't that so the whole the, purpose so much, of hardware sales is to get sure, make money? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. But I mean, you know, wasn't it supposed to be a limited edition thing where it was like, oh, you know, this is limited edition. It's coming out once and then after that, never again. And here we are again. So let me get the question or let me get this straight. You were first mad that they didn't have enough because it was quote unquote a limited edition. But now you're mad that they're releasing more. Sure. (laughs) Why not? Yeah, I was pissed because they didn't have it. And it was supposed to be a limited edition thing. I wanted to buy it. They didn't have it. And now it's like, oh, well, yeah, we're bringing it back now. You know, uh, making good on our, making you know for good faith. I mean, that's great. You know, awesome. I'm not buying it, of course, but uh, you they know, bur- they they burn that bridge too much for you to come back. Well, it's like how many other times is this going to happen? Honestly, you can't find a switch in the goddamn stores right now. I mean, seriously though, that's true. A switch. <laughs> uh, what is that? I know. Uh, this go this will go into more of what we're going to talk about in a tiny bit. Actually, it's going to be the next article. Uh, good job with the segue where I kind of botched it because I forgot the order of the the articles. But uh, it's kind of crazy that they you can't find a switch out there because, just because they're selling so well. And according to uh, NBT, NPD analysts, quote the the Nintendo Switch was August's best-selling hardware platform, and the Nintendo Switch has been the best-selling platform in four of the six months since launching in March 2017. Uh, but apparently when Sony hasn't topped the... or when Switch hasn't topped the star ch- chart... I can't speak right now with all these S's. Quote, Sony's plat- PlayStation 4 was the best-selling platform in both May and June. Sony's PlayStation 4 continues to be the best-selling hardware uh, platform year-to-date. Um... So it is going to show that the Switch is actually doing pretty well. Oh, my phone is going off. Um, sorry about that. But, yeah, the Switch is actually doing pretty well. Four of six months, it is go- goes to show you that PlayStation is still there. People It's still in the mind share that people are purchasing PlayStations. Uh, even it's been out for so long. But it, I wonder how well the Switch actually could be if you could find them in store shelves. You know, I would go out and purchase one right now if I could, uh, because well, I, I really am interested in the games we're going to speak about in the future in in a little bit. But the games that are coming out for it, we're going to take it on the go and play. Um, but now uh, you really want to hop in? I can see you're chomping at the bit to say something, Gary. No, before I, continue I was just going. I want to know from maybe he'll listen to to the podcast. Is it actually? An isolated incident here that's happening to Adam where he can't find a console? I mean, has anybody else had an easy time finding it? I mean, I'm I'm, I'm genuinely curious here. I mean, I go to Is Amazon it, all the time, and I can only buy the quote-unquote used versions where they jack up the price of yeah. 100 extra dollars. It's kind of that frustrating. Sucks, yeah. I remember listening to a Giant Beast podcast where they're talking about when they were trying to look for the Switch, and they couldn't quite find it, and it was on Amazon again for 400 bucks, And uh, it just goes – it's just frustrating, and I – it just it's it goes back to what they were doing with the NES Classic, and that's why I'm uh, hesitant about the Super NES Classic edition because I want the SNES Classic because I want to play those games that I never got around to play, but I'm just nervous I'm not going to be able to get it. And if this any consolation, how long since it's it's September now, six months now since it's released, and I still can't get the, the Switch anywhere. I can't find it anywhere. I can't see it in store shelves. What's going to happen when you know the SNES Classic edition comes out? And I can't find it for six months, but it's a limited edition, and it's only going to be there for a year. I still, I'm. If they are not be able to stock store shelves with the Switch, how do you expect them to stock store shelves with the Super NES Classic? I'm not trying to hate on Nintendo. It just seems like this is a consistent pattern that you have to call out, and it can be kind of frustrating for people that actually want to, you know, contribute to Nintendo. They're happy that they're succeeding. They want to purchase their products because people do love Nintendo. It's without a doubt a truthful statement. Yeah, and I. I- one thing I, I know you already brushed on it, but I'm stunned that the PlayStation Four has 
being the best seller in May and June. I mean, this console came out in 2014. It's three years. I mean, the fact that that is outperforming the Switch, which is a newer console, and also Xbox One, that's very impressive to me. I mean, that's just, you know... It's been outperforming the Xbox One for months upon oh, months. Yeah. Well, My, th- well, yeah. I do want to point out that it is the, you know, sales-wise, have for the Xbox 360, or Xbox One and PlayStation 4 have been astronomically better than the previous generation, which is saying something where people were back in the day saying, oh, video game console hardware is dead, uh, long yeah, live PC, yeah. well, that sort of uh, that sort of shit the bed now with the PS4, Xbox One doing so well, and now the Switch actually producing pretty well. And uh, when we had that talk about why you should buy the Switch with Kat, and she purchased the Switch, she's been playing it more than her PC. I don't know if that's still up to date. Cat, tweet at Two Jersey Kids or tweet us on our personal accounts. Let us know. Uh, so if you're still playing that more than the PC, but yeah, go to show you. And you know, Gary, we mentioned when it came to the Switch. You didn't want the non, you didn't want the baby games that Nintendo always offered. But now they're bringing in actually third party non baby games, which is exciting uh, because apparently Bethesda is also bringing Doom and Wolfenstein to the Nintendo uh, to the Nintendo Switch on September thirteenth. Publisher Bethesda, whew, excuse me, announced that it is porting both the recent reboot of Doom and the upcoming shooter Wolfenstein to the new Colossus to Nintendo's portable slash console hybrid. So there you go. I mean, I think Bethesda is starting to see the writing on the wall that people are enjoying the Switch, so they want to figure out a way to bring these shooters, their 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 games, to the Nintendo Switch because there is a market for them, and I, I feel like people would definitely want to get a different experience on the Nintendo Switch. But I'm, I'm also genuinely curious to see how the Switch console is going to handle... The game itself, how it's going to compare to the PS4 version or Xbox One version or PC version for that matter, because I saw an article today uh, that the NBA NBA game that's releasing on the Switch is running at 30 frames per second, 30 frames per second, where the PS4 and Xbox One were 60 frames. So it's sort of not that I care too much about that, but it does show you sort of a difference between what the the certain consoles are outputting versus what the Switch will be outputting. I mean, granted, it is a console hybrid, so you, it's still the fact that it's producing an NBA 2K18 game at 30 frames per second is still amazing. That's one of the main reasons I want to go out and get a Switch is that I can play an, uh, an actual uh, next-gen or current-gen game on the go, which is what was promised way back when with the Vita, long live the Vita. God, I love the Vita. Um, but it never came to that point. Don't roll your eyes at me. The Vita's good. Um, but <laughs> it, that's what it's... It, if the Switch can promise, that's what makes me excited. If it can bring more up-to-date shooters, like new first-person shooters like Wolfenstein 2, New Colossus, or Doom, it's fantastic. Fantastic to, See, bring, to bring that to the console, I think. That's correct. I think it's good, but I think the really the there big thing for them... No, I, I think the big thing for them is going to be when they have these these games, like Doom, for example, releasing their new versions on the console itself. Like, I understand they couldn't have possibly... You know, Doom wasn't just going to make a new game all of a sudden for the Nintendo Switch when it came out, obviously. So they had to port these older games over, you know, but... And that's good. I mean, it's, it's good that they have more games available. It's good that... A Nintendo Switch owner can play Xbox 360, or sorry, uh, Xbox One and PlayStation 4 games. That's great, but I just don't know if it's going to be enough to make people switch. Like, if someone has a PlayStation 4, if it's going to be enough to make them want to buy a Nintendo Switch because they they see Skyrim on the Switch. Now, I don't like for me personally, that wouldn't be enough for me to to switch over. I know. Like, we're saying switch a lot here in this in this uh, segment, but sponsor us, Nintendo. It, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, but yeah. It's good. The third party thing is good. It's just a matter of them getting newer, uh, quote unquote, non baby games to the to the Switch for the more mature, I guess, crowd. Not that people that are playing the Nintendo Switch aren't mature. That's not the statement I'm trying to uh, make, but you get the idea. So yeah, yeah, uh, I completely understand. Um, but uh, what was I going to say? You mentioned you don't see that many people making the Switch. I personally would try maybe move over to the Switch if they could start bringing more, you know, third-party games that are actually exciting so I could take them on the go. And I feel like this console hybrid is actually perfect for, you know, more young adults like me that actually work now and can't do sit 
buy the TV and do it constantly. Maybe they're traveling. Maybe they're going to work. Maybe they're uh, certainly. taking public transportation. And I feel like this is a more beneficial for you know young adults or adults it's, who want to play Nintendo games on the go. It's certainly it, it's certainly a good thing. I, I think that if they, for example, if you want to take the game Anthem for for example, okay, so Anthem comes to Nintendo Switch. You know, the same time. At the same time that it releases on the Xbox One and PlayStation 4. So you don't have like any gap between when Anthem comes out for, you know, different consoles. I, I just like if Nintendo Switch can get into that where they have like all these games releasing on their on their console at the same time as the Xbox and PlayStation, like I think that's when they'll finally kind of like I don't know, get the respect. I, I don't know the word I'm looking for here, but that, that's when they'll be kind of be relevant, like kind of put in the same category, I think, as the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One, if you get my meaning. Yeah, and I, I mentioned, uh, I wrote in the doc to make sure to mention this, but I feel like now you see Bethesda, which is a large publisher, bringing games over to the Switch. I could definitely see more developers and publishers bringing their game to the Switch because they're seeing that market share, which they didn't see with the Wii U. That's why you never saw games coming over to it. it but publishers and developers will find a way to put their game on your console if you can show that it has a market base for it. If it has a user base that will actually go out and purchase it. That's why I know I you roll your eyes when I say the Vita. That's why people still bring games to the Vita because they see that uh, – what's the – not user rate. Um, shit. What's the word? What's the word that I'm looking for? They just uh, – when they bring a game to the Vita, they know that the Vita users are actually going to go out because they're clamoring for games. They're actually going to support the games that are on it, and they actually see that the, it does pretty well when they bring a game to the Vita um, because they actually want to support it. So we'll see if that happens with the Switch as well when the third-party games come over to it, uh, if they'll actually want to support it and purchase the game on the Switch of itself. But moving on, uh, we talked about NPD for hardware. Now we're going to go to software, and Gary – I made sure to ask you not to read this because I want to make you guess. Uh, but for this is the for the month of August, and I want to bring back the segment of where did Grand Theft Auto Five rank this this month, this past month in sales uh, when it came to software? Huh. Uh, number three. Wow, good guess. Number two, actually. Number Damn. two. <laughs> it is really impressive that Grand Theft Auto Five is still doing this well. Uh, but I just want to go over the top uh, top 10 software sales in August 2017. Number 10, Overwatch. No surprise there. Overwatch still... I think Overwatch is going to be a little, kind of like Grand Theft Auto V where it's just still there. But it's still impressive that Grand Theft Auto V is... I, I just can't... It's just mind-boggling that it's still charting that high. Uh, then you have number 9, Crash Bandicoot and Saint Trilogy. Goes to show you that people still love Crash and it's doing great. Ch- charted... Nine in August. Uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare Remastered. Kind of shocking. Number eight. Mario Kart 8 at number seven. Tom Clancy Rainbow Six Siege. Number six. That's kind of in the same vein of Overwatch. And Grand Theft Auto V where it's still popping left and right. Sometimes pops in there. Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Number five. Number four. Splatoon 2. Number three. Uncharted Lost Legacy. Which I keep forgetting that it came out. And I always want, I want to go back and play it. But... I don't know what it is about this one. I just haven't, you know, gone around and gone to it. I'm not sure why. Number two, Grand Theft Auto V, like I mentioned. And number one, Madden NFL 18. Shh, not shocking because people still do love their Madden games, even though it's most of the time a carbon copy. But nevertheless, moving on, <laughs> unless you have any comments about the software sales that just just happened. No, I think you kind of summed up everything I, uh, everything I wanted to say. The Grand Theft Auto V thing is just out of control. <laughs> But yeah. Uh, but apparently, according to uh, what's his name, uh, director over that Blizzard's game director for Overwatch, apparently player toxic- toxicity in Overwatch is delaying the updates. This comes from Engadget. As with many other popular multiplayer video games, toxicity is a real issue. Some players make it their sole mission to grief teammates, while others threaten to throw the game if they don't get to play their chosen characters. Me coming in on this one, Adam, right here. I just want to, before we move on, whatever the the fact that the people want to throw the game is don't get their chosen characters, I just want to say stop being fucking babies. That's the fucking stupidest thing to get pissed off about. Fucking learn how to play other characters. Jesus Christmas. I don't get that. Why do you just ruin other people's fun because you're a baby and can't just, you know, play something else? Play another character. 
But that's me neither here or there. I just want to just, you know, yell at these people's faces for being so such little babies. <sighs> Moving on. It's particularly prevalent in Blizzard's team-based first-person shooter Overwatch, so much so that the game director Jeff Kaplan has said that the development of new maps and features are continually being pushed back in order to, quote, make people behave better, end quote. In this week's Overwatch bulletin, Kaplan spends the majority of the time talking about how the game's reporting controls are faring, ending with a message to players stating that if things stay as they are, the rollout of shiny new features will slow down as developers focus more on introducing more measures to battle toxicity. Toxicity. Kaplan states, quote, We want to make new maps, we want to make new heroes, we want to make new animated shorts, but we've been put in this weird position where we're spending tremendous time Tremendous amount of time and resources punishing people and trying to make people behave better. End quote. Kaplan noted that while some are skeptical of the in-game reporting system, which has been available on PC for some time, but only recently come to consoles, of the 480,000 players who received the disciplinary action, 340,000 of those did so because someone reported them. Kaplan adds, quote, I wish we could take the time we put into having reporting on console and have put that towards a mass match history system or a replay system instead it was the exact same uh, it was the exact same people that had to work on both who got rerouted to work on the other the bad behavior is not just ruining the experience for one another but the ba- bad behavior is also making the game progress in terms of development at a much slower rate uh, ellipsis the community needs to take a look deep look inward Think about all the times somebody said something negative to you in the game and imagine now if somebody had said something positive to you instead. There is a way to spread positivity that I don't think is really prevalent prevalent right now. End quote. Gary, thoughts? Well, I am kind of confused, to be honest. I I don't really understand. As a developer, okay, they're a a game developer obviously making this game. You know, it's a competitive game. Even though it, there's a lot of cooperative elements, it's still competitive. So you have this toxic community that's formed. How are you actually going to monitor this community? I mean, I understand you can ban people and everything, but you can't control people's behavior. And in this situation, if you're allowing your company to be to be held back mm-hmm. and not be – if you're allowing your company to not be able to get work done because these assholes in your game are being assholes, I don't really understand that. Like, I, I mean – I, I think it's honorable that they're trying to get people to get their shit together and, and, and to stop being douchebags to each other. But at the same time, it's like you can't just sit here and be like, oh, well, you know, we haven't been able to put out these updates because the community has been so terrible. Like, well, yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm really kind of it's very it's a strange thing because the fact that they came out and said this now, you're almost now bringing the spotlight to your game again and you get. Almost you almost enable now these people to to go out there and be even worse. Mm. You know, you you brought light to it. Now all these twelve year olds out there, all these angry twelve year olds are going to get out there now and start you know being worse than they were before, being more toxic. So I'm confused about this whole thing, to be honest. Strange. Yeah, and I, I I don't know. I it's somewhat now that you mentioned that it it makes it kind of sound more of like an excuse, so to speak. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it does, it's very weird. It brings light to the fact that maybe you're making excuses for yourself. Maybe you say you want to add these features, but you haven't because you're looking into another feature. And I get it. You're noble. You want to fix the toxicity in your community. But let's be real. Dota 2 has a lot of concurrent players still to this day. That community, toxic, toxic as hell. League of Legends. Yeah. Huge amount of people play League of Legends still. Toxic community as hell. You can't. You can't break the toxicity. I'm sorry. It's just not going to happen. People are going to be assholes. And I also think that it comes down to people policing other people when it comes to these games. I feel like it comes to actual people reporting bad crap and, you know, taking, you know, not taking that anger that they get received on them and then exporting it out to other people later in the game. And also, I think it's also on the onus of people that want to play, especially when it comes to team-based games, either don't have a mic on and not be listening to people's audio, or be chatting with friends and having a good time and ignoring other people, because who cares what other people say over the internet, honestly. 
uh, over yeah. af- after a while, you have to realize that they're just somebody on the other side of a screen who wouldn't say that to you in real life. I, I guarantee you that nine hundred or no nine hundred and ninety nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine people out of one million would not say that to your face. I guarantee you, the people that you know yell, scream obscenities at you over a screen or typing it through a keyboard would not do that. And I'm sure there's been studies out there that show all the time that people are more toxic or they're they feel better saying these more hateful things over because they don't feel like they're you know it's not they're sending they're, it not threatened. To a, they're sending it to a screen they're not sending it saying it to a person so they're sending it to a screen where there's a, sort of a middleman in between where they don't feel like they're actually hurting someone per se or they're you know they're, they're specifically they don't get to see the human reaction of somebody getting a hateful message to them i mean i guarantee, yeah. guarantee you if somebody said like there's obscene person things to a person they would feel awful about themselves unless they're they're a real jerk let's be real whoever would say that to somebody in real life is a douchebag jerk and probably you know yeah. no one should hang out with them um but i agree but yeah, yeah this i completely agree with that but yeah you you are absolutely right this is like I, I feel like this is an excuse though by this company it's like come on like you put a you put a report feature in the game and you have people report these bad players i know it's not possible to get mm-hmm. everybody out there that's being a douche but you know you can't just allow your company like to just sit back and be like all right well we couldn't do all this because uh you guys are being tools uh, it's just kind of i don't buy that shit sorry yeah and overwatch is such a large community that you're kind of hindering the many yeah to you know, try to solve the minority issues of the people that are in it, and they're you're giving them more power than they actually need, or they exactly. that they should have. Just keep providing content that people do love about this game, or they want from this game. Keep providing, keep rewarding good players for doing good things, and you know, I don't know. Just you're giving too much power to the minority of people that act like complete idiots online instead of, you know, making the game a better better game, a better experience for people that don't actually deal with these idiots online because they're smart enough to not listen to them. They're smart enough to talk with friends and play this game with friends or just put everybody else on mute. I mean, me and you did that all the time with Call of Duty because we got tired of listening to other people who were just chatting with yeah. each other. Um, but it just goes to show you there's – you can't, you know, be – paralyzed because of one minority community and you should add things that will benefit your game in the long run add those systems you're talking about like a match history system or a replay system i mean there's a lot of things you can add to your game instead of you know worrying about this this small field i mean that's just that's just how i feel 100 i agree and continue with this overwatch theme i kind of thought this was funny uh especially the comment that i'll read at the end um, but apparently, uh, Gearbox's boss, uh, had a, an explanation on Overwatch's effects. He didn't really think that Overwatch had an effect on Battleborn, which, if you remember a few episodes back, I could not, for the life of me, remember the name of Battleborn. Uh, but Gearbox president Randy Pitchford isn't so sure that the release of Overwatch directly impacted the sales of Battleborn. Quote, let's imagine Overwatch didn't exist at all. I don't know that anything would have been different. Maybe Battleborn would have had the exact, or had the same exact audience it had. It just wouldn't have been compared. I'm telling you this, if Overwatch did not exist and it had exactly the same results, a lot of people would have would have see, seen, uh, said, I'm guessing, maybe it was a mix up in the quote, uh, I'm just copying and paste. Sorry, I, I don't do work like Gary does with the Wikipedia articles. Um, <laughs> quote: Oh, that was a winner. That's a new IP and successful. And holy crap, where did this come from? And cool. And I would have been seen in totally different. And it would have been seen in a totally different light, even if it sold not a single unit more than it did. End quote. I wanted to put in this comment, IGN comment from uh, Minister with a one in there. Kind of summed up my thoughts. Quote, one game was 30 frames per second. The other, the other was 60 frames. One game had characters hidden behind paywalls. The other unlocked from day one. One had DLC day one and a season pass. The other released maps, characters, and game updates for free. One game was vastly superior to the other. End quote. And it kind of goes to show you, when you're in this sort of realm, people are going to compare games. And if you have Battleborn releasing the same time as Overwatch, I was the fool that bought Battleborn at full price, thinking that, oh, this would be a cool game to purchase. Then I played Overwatch, like, 
shit, I was wrong. That game's so much better. Um, but I don't know what he's talking about that Overwatch didn't have an effect on it. People saw that Overwatch was a better game, uh, and they're obviously going to gravitate towards that game more, and it just seems like that's just a asinine thing to say, or you're just in complete denial about your game not being nearly as good. Uh, the art style wasn't as good. The characters weren't as interesting, like the, the person mentioned. Uh, you're behind paywalls. It was... It was... And when you also mentioned... I know somebody made a good point. When you mentioned that if you had the same amount of success, sales that you do now, it was seen as such a success. I want to say right now, you wouldn't have had this... If Overwatch didn't exist, you wouldn't have the same amount of sales because you would have kept your game at 60 bucks, and I don't think it would have done it as well. I think most of the sales for Battleborn... Units wise, actually came when you dropped the price. You kept lowering the price because you realized you were getting shat on by Overwatch, and you finally <laughs> dropped it all the way down to like five bucks, and then finally released a free to play model of it. So don't give me that whole BS. I think you're smoking something if you really think that. I don't. Yeah, you're he's just uh, in he's denial. Just, I, I just he, he's towing the company line. He's got to sound like, oh, we were not worried. We weren't worried at any time that we were <sighs> getting completely screwed. Trent. Please, come on. Guy got, guy got completely roasted by some random person on the internet. Hilarious. There was, there was more IGN comments where they're saying basically the same thing. Um, yeah. And also, somebody actually made a good comment. Uh, they're talking about, have you heard the game Paladins? Uh, I forget who. Yeah, high, so, high yeah. Res. It's basically Overwatch. It basically looks just like Overwatch. Just the characters have different coats of paint, and they kind of look somewhat different. Um, but they do have a lot of characters that do the same thing. Uh, they didn't mention that it'd be kind of a, a smart idea if they try to get the um, Paladins over to the Switch because the Switch doesn't have Overwatch or Battleborn, and they try to get a, a, a sort of team-based shooter like that that's not, car- well, actually, it would be kind of cartoony, but more, you know, team-oriented than you know the multiplayer Splatoon. Yeah. I'm not to say it's no. not team no, based, I... it's just, <laughs> you know what I mean, donate on me, people. Yee. You're, uh... <laughs> that was the last article, people, I don't know if you've realized, but yeah. I didn't really have too much to say, because you summed up, again, what I was going to say anyway, so, you know, the hell with you. Wow, that's not nice. We do this for fun, <laughs> Gary, don't be mean. <laughs> that's not nice of you, but Gary, that's it for the article's... For this week, do you have anything to mention before you roll on out of here? Uh, just the same old, I guess. I will be, be on... streaming tonight, right? Yeah, I'll be streaming later tonight. I'll be streaming maybe tomorrow, depending on what... Well, I'm going to have off tomorrow from work. So yeah, I'll stream, off to... I'll stream tomorrow night probably as well. Maybe Sunday. I kind of like to stream every day if I can, but uh, it's not always a possibility. But um, yeah, I'll be on PUBG until Destiny 2 comes out, and then it's like... Destiny 2 to till the day I die, or until Destiny 3 so comes out. So you purchased out. it on PS4, and now you're going to purchase it on your PC? Yeah, I kind you of, uh, I, had to, I had to be honest, I had to be honest, I kind of regret buying it on the console, because it's not that I regret buying it on console, I enjoy the game, uh-huh. but I don't want to play it right now, because I want to kind of still have it fresh when I play on PC, where which is where I want to, you know, basically dump most of my time into anyway where there um, go, there you go there you have it folks i am never going to get destiny 2 because i'm going to have nobody to play it with so that's how it well, that's how i feel on on console right now I unless mean, you friend me on ps4 feel free hit me up on twitter and i'll friend you there you go i'm friends with there uh, you go. Uh, uh nikita on on ps4 uh, oh nice yeah i meant to play i was gonna play with a game a game with him a while back and i completely i think it was titanfall 2 Sorry, man. If you're still on and want to play Titanfall 2, hit me up tomorrow. I'll play with you. But um, this has been Two Jersey Kids. If you're a new listener, thank you so much for sticking with us. Please hit that subscribe button. Please go rate us on iTunes. It'll help us out a lot. If you're a continued listener, you're awesome. You're a Jersey Kid. If you hit that subscribe button, I forgot to mention, you are become an honorary Jersey Kid. I know it's exciting. You officially just automatically get embowed with the odor of an armpit just because that's how it is. I don't know what I'm talking wow. about. Wow. Yeah. That's unfortunate. People always make the joke that the Jersey is the armpit yeah. of the U.S. Yeah. I would like of course, to say, of course. I would like to say the North Jersey portion is the armpit of the U.S. South Jersey is better. <laughs> there you go. Agreed. Um, uh, but yeah, 
We appreciate you all for listening. Keep listening with us. We'll be releasing episodes every Friday. We're trying to release them. Uh, we normally try to record on Thursday, so it comes out right on Friday, but due to work schedules, as we mentioned last week, doesn't really work out that way too much anymore. Next week's going to be a little bit difficult uh, because I'll be on call, so me and Gary have to figure out some things scheduling-wise of recording, but we'll figure it out. Uh, we'll be here sometime next week. Uh, we love you all. Gary, say bye. Adios. Remember, follow us on Twitter at Tutorsy Kids. Have a good one. Keep playing those games. Bye.